Great. Um, my name is Adria Katz. I'm the managing director at the Multicultural Arts Center. I'm thrilled to welcome uh, Bill Chapman with us today, who is our artist presenting at an exhibition called Gospel in Motion at the Multicultural Arts Center Gallery right now. Um, and we have a couple, we have today and tomorrow are the last days to see the show. So please come on by if you haven't seen it in person or tune in virtually on the um, on our virtual gallery. So I wanna just start by saying, I am gonna ask people to be muted during the conversation, um, but you are welcome to unmute yourself if you have a question to ask or drop something into the, um, into the chat and we will be sure to monitor that. Are people able to hear me? I see one person saying that there's an issue. I'm good. You're other? Okay. Uh, Luann, you may have to turn your volume up. Uh, so in, in, before we get started, I want to just uh, acknowledge uh, where we are here in the Multicultural Arts Center, it's situated on ancestral and present day lands of the Nipmunk and Massachusetts people. And also, in addition, I want to recognize that we're in a virtual space. Um, and so in order to acknowledge that, I'd like to share this digital land acknowledgement that was written by an artist named Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Collaborative. Um, and I'll drop her information in the chat too, so you can learn more about her. Since our activities are shared digitally on the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded with the within the technology structures and ways of thinking that we use every day. We are using equipment and high speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints contributing to change in climates that disproportionately affect indigenous people worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging all of this as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization and allyship. And with that, um, I am going to introduce Bill Chapman um, and then we will hand it over to Zoe, the marketing and communications manager and Bill to facilitate uh, this conversation. So as Ernest Whalers used to say, the pictures tell a story. So we're gonna have a brief bio and then you can take a look at the images. Um, but here's a little bit about Bill for those of you who don't know. From an early age, Chapman's interest in politics, civil rights, baseball and music were tied to his passion for photography. Guided by the following quote from his mentor, Ernest Withers, you are an American, you know what to do. Chapman traveled throughout America to discover the cruel radiance of what is, as Walker Evans put it. Over the years, he explored each of those topics and much more through film and digital imagery. America has experienced a daunting number of peaks and valleys in the treatment of its citizenry and the way it represents itself within its own borders. Chapman set out to both befriend and embrace that America through his photographs. His work's been exhibited at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, Gallery Cayafas, Harvard University, the Griffin Museum, and many other locations. And he's been published in a number of publications. Um, we're thrilled to have you with us today, Bill, and I will hand it over now to Zoe, who can continue the conversation. Hey, Bill. So. Hey. So over the last um, six weeks, I've had the greatest pleasure getting to know Bill, who um, I didn't realize when I first met Bill had actually known my parents decades before. Bill has been an artist, a photographer in the Boston area for many decades. He has a wealth of stories, a wealth of images. There is so much to this man that I'm so excited we're able to share. Um, Bill has put together a presentation of slides, which um, slides of, well, of his images. And uh, he feels the best way really to tell his story is through his photographs. And um, I'm probably merely going to be the person turning the pages of his life. But um, we're going to start with a collection of 20 images that span um, from the 90s to present. Is that right, Bill? Or from the 90s yes, to the early? Yeah. We're going to start with the first uh, set of 20. And um, as we talked about, Bill, I was hoping that, you know, in your work, you often have, um, we often see similar themes of American culture and baseball and music. 
And I was hoping as you go through this first round of 20 images, you could touch a little bit on your investigation of American culture and what you've seen, what you're drawn to, in addition to um, what draws you to certain subjects. Like Elvis often appears in your work. Um, I'd love to just hear more about that. I know you and I have talked a lot, but it would be great for you to be able to share. So I'm going to open up the presentation and then I'm gonna hand it over to you, Bill, to get started with walking us through these images from your life, okay? Great, thank you. Sure, one second, guys. Okay. Well, this is the smoke, up. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the Smoky Mountains in uh, North Carolina. I've been drawn to flags. Uh, actually, I had my first camera when I was about 10 in fourth grade. It was an old box camera, very primitive. In those days, you had a roll of film. You could take 12 square pictures on the roll. You took the roll to your drugstore. And a week later, Big Brother Kodak would send them back in an envelope, a yellow envelope. I didn't really pursue photography uh, seriously until high school. My dad had a dark room that he hadn't used for years. And so I cleaned it up and started doing my own dark room process. Um, and it went from there. Next. That's me in high school. And I, I became pretty adept at photography early on. And I also, through photography, learned about control. I was a yearbook photographer. And if you weren't nice to this nerd, you didn't appear in the yearbook. Um, I left there, went to Suffolk University, majored in English. That's OK, go ahead. And then went to Mass College of Art. You can flip it. And that's me three years after high school. Next. I bring up the Beatles because it's the first concert I ever saw. And with those last two images in this, you know all about me that you really need to know. So you can lean now if you'd like. Next. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything pre-1990 digitized, very few things. So these will all be, um, as Zoe said, post-1990. I, uh, I had some terrible health problems and was not given a long life expectancy in 1990. So I said, given that, I'm going to go photograph baseball instead of sit in my room. And I photographed all 26 minor league ballparks, uh, major league ballparks in the country, and then started on the minors. I became a photographer for the Pawtucket Red Sox, and I was far more interested in the people in the stands than I was baseball. But I did what I had to do on the field. Uh, this just happened to be something that I came across and thought, well, that's pretty interesting. And um, those are the stands at McCoy Stadium in Pawtucket. Next. And Bill, can we talk a little bit about what it is about baseball that has drawn you in for all these years? It seems like from the very beginning, baseball has intrigued you. And I don't know, and you're saying it's very much the spectators in addition to the players. I'm wondering where that interest came from. Was it something from your childhood or just something that's always been with you? Well, yeah, I grew up about a mile and a half from Fenway Park, and um, there were no other sports televised. Baseball, if we were lucky, was televised um, once a week, and they had one camera mounted besides home plate. But my dad would give me a buck, and the tee was a nickel each way to get there and 50 cents to get in. And that left me 40 cents to buy a Coke and a dog, which would probably be eight or nine dollars today. So I pursued it from them. And Everything about it, the people, the history, uh, I became very acclimated to. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to Mass College of Art, as I mentioned, which was down the street from Fenway. And Mass Art was a pass-fail art school. And I was on independent study in photography for my first class. And most afternoons, I would be down at Fenway. So it really caught on with me in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And it just never left me. And when I had the opportunity to travel, I had always said, I want to hit every ballpark in the country. Okay. I did. This is St. Louis. Uh, they're twins, obviously. St. Louis and the Cubs have the same rivalry as the Red Sox and the Yankees. And I thought, God, how odd is it that the parents dress them in these opposing uniforms? And my only question about this is, 
which one went to 12 step and which one went to become a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> Next, please. This is, of course, CNN uh, in Atlanta. Things just amuse me. It's the dichotomy of America where two opposite things will come together and be so odd, but still in their own structure. Um, it interests me to photograph that. I essentially only photograph things so I can see them again. And if other people like them, that's great too. But uh, I photograph for myself primarily. And, and uh, the last two years have been horrific because travel has been out of my picture, but hopefully we'll get back to that very soon. Um, you can go forward. This is in New York in Times Square. Um, I just happened to be crossing the street and saw this. And again, it's that dichotomy of, you know, the image and the taxis whizzing by. Um, I might also add that I never crop anything and I do as little post-production as possible, if any. Uh, that's something I learned in the 70s and um, have pursued it ever since. I do print my own color. In the old days, I was in a color dark room till they stopped making color film and um, color paper, so that ceased. And I fought off using digital stuff as long as I could, but um, I had to give in, I had no choice. And like I said, I do my own printing here now. Um, and we can go forward. People, if you wanna jump in and ask me anything, please go right ahead. Um, a, a friend of mine who's with us today told me that I, I used to photograph kids and mascots at ballparks. I, expend, I ex, uh, extended that field, but um, here's throwing out the opening pitch, the Michelin Man at uh, Pawtucket. And again, it's, it's two things that are very separate and they're incongruous, but they work together because that's our America. I was also told by a curator that I'm sardonic, but good natured. And I like that very much. I think that pretty much sums me up. We can go forward. And let me just pause for a minute, Bill. Is there, does anybody have um, any questions at this point about any of the images we've looked at so far? Adri, I can't really see the full screen. Do you see? Some people aren't being able to hear. I'm seeing that in the chat, so I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I think Lynn uh, hopefully was able to turn up her volume. I'm not sure. But if you're still having an issue, Luann, you can feel free to drop it in the chat and I can get it up to you. Okay. No, I, I can hear you fine. I, you know, the problem that I was having before, I was in the, the Evan Bright. So I just closed everything up, went back and clicked on Zoom and everything started working fine. But when you say 70s, you're talking about the 1970s, right, Bill? Yes, sir. <laughs> Yankee fan alert. <laughs> how, Bill, have you seen, um, I have a question for you, Bill. Um, how have you seen American culture evolving over these years? Like, even if you just say the baseball park, for example, have you seen a large change over the years as you've explored these baseball parks? Well, I mentioned fourth grade and I was, uh, I grew up in Brookline. I was an Irish Catholic and the man elected president was an Irish Catholic, John Kennedy. So our amount of uh, identification with him was extraordinary. And of course, in seventh grade, he was assassinated. I watched uh, Lee Harvey Oswald being uh, killed on television, sitting with my father. And my interest in politics grew. I, I looked to Lyndon Johnson as an icon in the seventh grade. And what I've learned about him, he's the devil and God incarnate, but um, he did some valuable things. And from then on, I kept my interest. I photographed for Teddy Kennedy for a bit. Um, I always kept my foot in the door um, following politics, etc. And of course, when I was uh, hitting high school, the, the, the civil rights events struck and we were, we got all of our news from uh, the newspapers and then a little bit from television, but that is where that came in and music too with the Beatles and then other groups and uh, my first uh, my first photography class, Gus K. Office was my instructor, had us do a semester assignment and some people did their cats or their boyfriends. I followed the Grateful Dead around um, and it's still in a box here somewhere. 
But America does have its problems, and I'm not denying that. And the problems are very similar to the problems that we've had through our history. Uh, and we're trying to get better. And uh, it's very difficult to read the news every day. And it has been for quite some time. Um, I still, I'm still an American. Uh, I'm very proud of it. And uh, I will listen to anybody's viewpoint, but um, you know, what can I tell you? My country right or wrong. Yep. Do you want to speak of this image up right now? Sure. Um, this is Rickwood Field. It's in Birmingham, Alabama. It's the oldest ballpark in the country. It's two years older than Fenway. They don't use it except for uh, events. But once a year, the minor league team, the Birmingham Barons, come back to play what's called the classic game uh, to raise funds for the park. And every year they celebrate a year from their past, which goes all the way back to 1910. This year they were celebrating the war years. And I just thought it was striking that, uh, you know, here they are and they're imitating, uh, uh, representing Iwo Jima on the field. I am their photographer and have been for 16 years. We'll talk more about that later. Birmingham has a great history uh, with the Negro League players and also one of the most horrible uh, series of events in civil rights history too. <coughs> Excuse me, we can go. This is the Martin Luther King Memorial in DC. I call this picture Jubilee because it reminds me of these women who are probably on a tour around DC congregating in front of this all dressed in their finery as they would would in a church and it it allowed me to represent them and also the statue which is which is pretty massive you don't really pick that up if you see solitary pictures of it we can go now i was in washington at the time the uh the Smithsonian African American Museum was opened. There was a fundraiser uh, for the Withers Foundation and I didn't have tickets to the Smithsonian, but they had uh, large cameras on a field outside and um, Obama spoke, George W. spoke. They had a lot of speakers, but again, it's the flag and it's again, something that I'm interested in. And she was, snapping her fingers to Obama. And I thought, this is just great. And uh, there it is. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful picture. I guess we, <clears throat> this is one of my favorites you. of yours. Uh, I guess we can go forward. This is the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Probably most of you are familiar with the history. This is in Selma, Alabama. Uh, there was a march from Selma to Montgomery over voters' rights in 1965, about 500 marchers were met by police on horses, with clubs, with tear gas, and it wasn't a massacre. Nobody died, but people were beaten very badly. John Lewis, who was probably 20 at the time, the, the recently deceased um, representative of the United States was at the march. Uh, and I go to places like this. I I'm, I'm certainly can't feel the horror that those people felt. And, and a lot of people have felt um, in history ever since, but I can experience it. It was very eerie to walk across that and visualize that event. Um, they had another march. The, uh, the chief of police promised them they would be given free passage. Martin Luther came for it. They stopped at this, this part of the bridge because there were police all ganged up on the side. King decided not to cross the bridge and he got down on his knees and everybody with him, there were 2000 people at this point, prayed. And then they left. They didn't wanna go through that again if that was a possibility. So also around the bridge, we were driving by and I saw the next photograph. 
it was this was a mural on an abandoned car wash that somebody did and it, it it's absolutely amazing and uh if you go to the next photograph this is a close-up of it and it went on um for the whole length of that abandoned car wash and i said to my friend stop let me get out she said what for i said just just let me do it and um i have many photographs of it in detail and we can go to the next one again civil rights the flag it, it all it all comes through in my work and you have to remember that this being the south we can go on to the next one this was in somebody's yard in the deep south it's on the back of a for sale um sign and uh, I was driving with a buddy from the South and he was, he said, we can't stop here. We'll get, somebody will come out with a gun. So he stopped long enough for me to do this. Yeah. And um, we can go forward. I don't believe in this, by the way. Portraits are another um, big part of my work. Well, this is pause. at Rickwood Field. Can we pause hmm? for a second, Bill? Before we move into sure. the uh, uh, portraits. Does anybody have questions about that first set of images before we move into portraits? Can you see Adria? Because I can't see. <clears throat> you're, you're welcome to raise a hand if you'd like to, or um, just unmute yourself by choosing the, the okay. unmute button. Bill, I just would like to say that I feel like looking at those pictures and listening to what you say, you really epitomized that time period for me. I feel like the things that you captured and the things that you describe were so characteristic of our generation and the things that were important to us. And thank you for that. You're welcome, Elizabeth. It's nice to see you. you um, please ask questions. You don't want to listen to me for an hour. <laughs> Um, I take portraits, and it, it's not a, a major function of what I do, but as the photographer at Rickwood Field, I get to roam around in the stands. I've also had press access to a lot of baseball parks in the country, and at certain times uh, to Fenway Park, I, I never take a, photo, a portrait without engaging the person, <clears throat> and I asked this, this boy's mother if I could take his photograph, and I think he was bewildered or angry or scared. I've never been able to put that together and you can make your own assessment, but whatever he was, he was very, uh, very open about having his picture taken. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, we can go on to the next one. I tried some fashion. This is a friend of mine and this is Lincoln Center, but <clears throat> I was never very good at it. So I, I didn't stick with fashion long. It was too structured and too set up. Uh, we had gone to see Rhiannon Giddens at Lincoln Center. Uh, we can go next. This is Delia and I experimented with different covers for her book on surrealism. None of them were used, but we had a lot of fun doing it. We did all kinds of things, and this was one of them. I obviously photoshopped this and left the tarot cards that were painted uh, by Salvatore Dali in it. And it's just an example of something I do uh, that I'm very fond of doing. And we can go to the next one. Is it, uh, this is from that dinner for Ernest in DC uh, uh, four years ago, I believe, uh, whenever that opened. I highly recommend that museum too. It's absolutely, it's absolutely fascinating. The, the Smithsonian Afro Am Museum starts in the basement and goes through history in the basement are what it was like to be on a slave ship. And they go up through the periods of Afro-American history in America. Up, there's a civil rights floor, of course, and up to the top floor, which is all the entertainment, all the music, they even have the permanent uh, Parliament Funkadelic's mothership there and uh, dresses of Mahalia Jackson. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be um, given early entry into it. So I was there the first week and it was just a go. 
Joe, you don't need me to talk about it, but if you're in DC, please go. And who who is this um, woman in these? Because she's the same woman who was wearing the yellow coat in the previous image. There's something very compelling about her. Right. She is, uh, her name is Moshe Davis. She was raised in Birmingham. She's now in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I, she told me, I met her at the ballpark, and she told me she wanted to be a photographer. And I said, well, you can. And I helped her along. And today she is a wedding photographer in New Orleans and around the country. She, two years ago, she was named by Harper's Bazaar magazine as one of the 20 best wedding photographers in the world. And a couple of weeks ago by Bride magazine as one of the 20 best American photographers. So with her beginnings with a little camera and she's done all of this herself. I've just helped facilitate what she does. Um, she comes up here to visit. Uh, she's a big fan of uh, Bob Doyle down there in the corner and everybody she's met up here. She comes up every year for the Du Bois Awards too. Um, just a friend, that's all. She's a wonderful look to her. Oh, and she buys all of her clothes in consignment stores. When I met her, I thought, where's she getting all this money, uh, These the money for these outfits? And she goes to consignment stores and re-alters them, et cetera, so. Very cool. Should I go to the next? Go on. Hmm, yeah. This is Sasha Goodfriend, who's the director of Mass Now, and we did some publicity shots for her, and she just came up with this, um, you know, the portrait of the woman with a kerchief, and she didn't use it for publicity, but we love it. I love it. It's, uh, again, it's a dichotomy of two different things, the state house and um, somebody in a characteristic pose, American pose. Uh, and we can go forward with that. This is my friend Emma, who was a graduate student at Harvard. And we walked down to the Charles River and I, I asked her if I could take some portraits. And she said, certainly. And um, this is one of them. This isn't necessarily something I do, but I thought I'd include it in here. Um, so uh, I happened to see her. She came into town last summer. I hadn't seen her for three or four years since she had been at Harvard. Uh, we can go forward. That's Pedro Martinez. And I was asked to photograph him at Harvard. He was absolutely a delightful man. He spoke to a bunch of students. A lot of the um, Harvard baseball team were there. And he said to the group, he said, you know, I don't have a degree like you do, but here's my degree. And he held out his World Series ring. Um, delightful, funny, interesting man. And I was glad to have the chance to be in that proximity to him. And we can go. The day that Biden was officially announced as president, it was a Saturday, there was an instant rally on the common. And I happened to be going through there and there were lots of people. And this woman struck me with a flag and I asked if I could take her portrait. And she said, oh, sure. She was obviously so jubilant, um, and we all were, uh, the horns honking and people everywhere, all over the streets. Uh, I guess from reading the news that he actually didn't win the election. Is that, is that true? I, um, uh, that was trying me trying to be silly, folks. Um, the next one? That is Dave Chappelle. Harvard has the Du Bois Awards every year, except for the last two years, of course, and they give them to uh, philanthropists, uh, educators, and celebrities. And the first year I went, because Moshe wanted to go, it was Dave Chappelle and Colin Kaepernick. Um, the next year was, uh, oh God, I'm drawing a blank on her name. Uh, it'll come to me at two o'clock this morning. Um, but I have proximity to that, and, and I've always admired this guy. So that's another portrait. And that, my friends, is Nomar Garcia Para. If you're from Boston, it's Nomar. And I photographed him in the minor leagues two years before he came up to the Red Sox. That's in New Jersey. And I made him laugh, and he very rarely laughs in photographs. So that's great. 
we can go forward. I think that's it. Oh, here we go. Man All right. So I, this is one one um of the subjects I'd be interested in hearing more about is your interest in Elvis. You just recently had a show in the South End of um, images of Elvis that you had taken. I'd love to learn a little bit more about what compels you about this man. Well, I was in my, um, uh, I was probably five when Elvis hit the scene and I didn't really comprehend why it mattered. I just knew that I didn't like him because he had dirty hair. And I didn't really tap into, I listened to rock and roll, et cetera, on the radio at that early age. And then um, the Beatles came in and kind of wiped him off the entertainment map. But I've always been fascinated. I consider his life a tragedy. You know, at 19, he was a national, um, national figure. And at 22, he was a millionaire. And he was a Southern boy with high school education. He was driving uh, an electric truck, uh, delivering parts for an electric company, saved $4 to buy, to go into a recording studio and record uh, a song for his mother for Mother's Day. That's when your heartaches begin. And the owner of the studio, Sam Phillips, this was Sun Records, said to himself, this is the person I've been looking for. This is a white man with a black man's voice and soul. So Sam brought him along. Uh, he had many regional hits <clears throat> and Sam could not give him the exposure he needed. So he sold his contract to RCA. And that's when, that's when you started hearing things like Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel, et cetera. And people say, well, you sold his contract for $40,000, that was stupid. And Sam's answer was no. I invested in the beginning of Holiday Inn, which started in Memphis. So I made an awful lot of money and don't feel badly for me. Um, but, but the arc of his life from, from being the megastar that he was to joining the army because it was the right thing to do to make those 31 horrific movies that he made, but he was getting a million dollars a piece for him. But uh, as a career, it destroyed him. And then he came back in 68 uh, and acted like Elvis again in a black leather suit. And even then, uh, 1968, I was a junior. I was fascinated by that and didn't pick up on him really, but I was aware of him. And Ernest knew him when he was very young in Memphis. And so when I met with Ernest, it started to rekindle my interest. And I've read a lot about him. Um, and his life, and you know, he died at 42 of, of all of his excesses. Uh, he, there was nobody to control him. Who's gonna say no to Elvis? Cause he cut you off his payroll. And at the end, he was a very sad, very bloated man um, who, uh, who died. And um, when I got rekindled in that, I, I I realized he's still everywhere. You walk down the street and he's somewhere. Um, and I started to photograph that. I was spending a lot of time with Ernest in Memphis and around here in New York. And I turned that into an essay, which I called, um, uh, not that's where your heartaches begin, but it was one of uh, a fool such as us. And they asked me to present it at a gallery. And uh, we can go on to that. This was a bus in Memphis. Um, you can go on to the next one. This was in the Harvard Square bookstore. Like I said, he's everywhere. I turned around and it's like, God, there's Elvis. Um, <clears throat> I didn't touch a thing. There it was. And uh, we can go to the next one. That's me in about five years. But that's an Elvis impersonator that was at Downtown Crossing. I got off the, the orange line and I heard Elvis's Christmas music and I thought, well, this is odd. So I went and found it, and it was this gentleman who's doing karaoke to Elvis. And I stopped and I talked to him, and um, I asked if I could take his picture. And he said, of course, he really hammed it up. But this sign says, you know, uh, the, last, <clears throat> the last one with all the money figures is win a date with, uh, take a date with Elvis. Um, and afterwards, I looked for this man on the internet and everywhere else. 
I thought it would be great to follow him and go to his house and do an essay about him and stuff. But there's no trace of him. I could not find him. If you Google, uh, if you Google this, this picture will pop up or Elvis in Boston. Um, but that's the only trace. So uh, does that answer your question? I can. Yeah, that's perfect. I love it. That's perfect. Yeah, when I, uh, I don't undertake a project without reading everything I possibly can about it. So I read 12 or more books about Elvis. I even took a online course in uh, at Rhodes University about Elvis last year. And it was really funny. They were so resistant to me because here's a Northern boy talking about Elvis. And I didn't always agree with everything the professor said, um, but it was fun. It was really fun. Um, so we can go to the next one. I went to Graceland on the 40th anniversary of Elvis's death to photograph. I had been there a couple of times before. There were 20,000 people from all over the world. This is his grave, his dad's grave, his mama's grave, his uncle's grave, and over here is his grandmother's grave. And Elvis, uh, Elvis was born with a twin who was stillborn. And Jesse Garen, Elvis Aaron and Jesse Garen, his grave is over here, but these flowers go on for 50 or 60 yards. They're from all over the world. Um, it, 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 that's astounding in and of itself. It's a, it's a course in one part of Americana that you're not going to find anywhere else. And uh, as I said, Ernest knew him when he was young and photographed him. And we can go on to the next one. Oh, uh, we're missing one, but that's okay. Were we missing? Uh, no, no, no. Um, that that just may have not popped up. No, maybe it's uh, maybe it's with the Ernest pictures. I, I take that back. I also photographed concerts from a very early age. In 1968, I photographed Simon and Garfunkel and then The Who. For Simon and Garfunkel, I had my mother's Polaroid. My mother wanted a dishwasher. My dad gave her a Polaroid and it sat around in a drawer for a couple of years. It was an old boxy Polaroid. You pull the pictures out um and then you pull the paper off them and then you had to coat them with this gunky uh, lemon stuff so i smuggled my cat my dad's camera out of the house to see the who and it was the first time they played in america and i snuck down in the orchestra pit and i was doing concerts from then on and i've only included a couple this of course is uh she needs no introduction um but i photographed many, many, many bands. Uh, most of them probably you've never heard of. Uh, even Bob Doyle is an old enough to remember all of them. But um, that's what I did. And I learned this is part of a craft. Uh, and I went on and uh, it's, it's an acquired skill. You have to work at it and, and understand uh, the mechanics of it. And Another thing that I do is you wait for the right expression. You don't just go in there and hammer away. Um, so I learned how to do that from uh, baseball events and from doing the portraiture. Portraiture is, is different because people stand, stay still. But somebody like a singer, and I'll talk about this later, this difference between a performer, I can talk about it now, a difference um, between a performer and the Harlem Gospel Choir a performer is mugging for you. They're making faces, they're acting um, always. If you see Adele or whoever it happens to be on stage, they're acting for you. And the Harlem Gospel Choir don't act. They get very wrapped up in their connection to who they perceive as their God. And they're not mugging. They're not crying because their crocodile tears are faking it. They are really, really into it. And that's what makes them different as entertainers, and I always want to define that. But we can go on to the next one. This is due to uh, Colletier. He's part of the Django Reinhardt All-Stars. Um, I was a big fan of Django Reinhardt's music. Of course, he passed a long time ago. This band is from France. They come and tour America maybe once a year. There are seven of them, and they reproduce his music so perfectly, and it's so exciting. I've seen them several times and this guy is a character uh, they have a violin uh, three guitar players an accordion 
uh, stand-up bass, and drums. And I highly recommend them. I, I picked up Django Reinhardt's music from Woody Allen movies. So uh, you can hiss when I say Woody Allen if you want. But um, I, I very much listen to these guys. And uh, I'll see them when they come back. And we can go to the next one. This is uh, the Reverend Peyton and his wife, Washboard Breezy. It's Reverend Peyton and his big damn band. He's known as the best uh, country flat picker in the country. Uh, they do their own material. They only have a drummer with them. And uh, she plays the washboard and sings and he sings. Uh, they do a lot of old blue stuff and they do their own material. And I have just fallen head over heels over them over the last couple of years. I've seen them a few times uh, and I will go see them again. They're gonna be at the House of Blues in May. They're just, they're just tremendous to me. And uh, again, I don't have any real reason why I photograph concerts, except it's fun and I can do it. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just something that I do. So we can move forward. This is Dr. Ernest Columbus Withers. Uh, he was born in 1922. He passed 14 years ago. In the late 90s, I saw a show at Panopticon Gallery of his Negro League photographs. And I flipped. Boston is, is a racist city. It used to be worse, but there's no way around that. And the Boston Red Sox were the last team to integrate. They didn't do it till 1959. Um, and they did it uh, with the push from the city council. They said, if you don't do this, we're going to curtail the number of games you can play. And once they heard their money was going to be tampered with, my God, they had a black player. So I was aware of that early on. Um, and I knew a little about the Negro Leagues, but I saw his photographs, knew he was in Memphis. The gallery represented him and me at the time. Um, and I got invited to photograph a minor league all-star game in Memphis. So I called him up on the phone and uh, he asked me to come by his studio. And I thought, he pat me on the rear and send me on my way, but he didn't. He, he took me to a, a council meeting in Memphis and uh, he asked me to load his camera and he whacked me in the chest with the cameras like who, how Houdini died. And I was, you know, I've loaded hundreds and hundreds of rolls of film and I was terrified to fail this man, I didn't. But then he took me around Memphis for the day. He took me to where, um, King was slain. He took me to places that he ate. He took me to the funeral parlor where King was waked um, to what was left of the baseball field. And I went back to my hotel and he called me the next morning and said, this is Ernest Withers. Would you like to work with me today? Um, and when I stopped gasping, I said, certainly, of course. And he liked me and he took me in. And um, his family said it was very unusual for him to do that. But he's taken some of the most important civil rights, Negro League, and music pictures in American history. And he did it. He, uh, he learned photography in the Army. He came back. He became one of the first Black policemen in the Army and photographed at night. And he had a wife and seven children and another children that was not by, a child that was not by his wife. And he supported all of them with this, put them all through college. And he didn't become nationally and world known until he was... 80. And he became known through this gallery in Boston, who promoted him. He was taken on a tour by the UN of all the countries in Africa. Um, and he still still photographed, I went down to see him every chance I could afford it. And he was up in Boston. Um, so uh, when he was in ill health, we drove him to Tupelo, where Elvis was born. And he loved it because he knew of Elvis, et cetera. And the stories he told me, um, I wouldn't ask him questions, which is probably why he liked me so much because everybody was badgering him. I, I, I didn't ask him questions. I listened to what he said. And I went home, I went back to my hotel and I took notes. So um, I can tell you many, many stories of Ernest. There's a, there's a really good biography called Bluff City by Preston Lauderback 
which encompasses this whole life. And I, I gave a lot of back material for that. And I have photographs in it and stuff. Um, but I can, I can tell you earnest stories all day long as Zoe can begin to attest to. Um, but again, if we go to the next one, this is one of his photographs. There was a garbage, you, you probably, a lot of you have seen this. It's, it's very, very famous civil rights photograph. Um, how are we doing for time? Are we crushing on here? We've got about 10 more minutes. Can we go to questions? Yeah. Do you want to um, put these photos up first, Bill? Yeah, we, I'll go quickly. This is a young Willie Mays on the Birmingham Black Barons that Ernest took. Hold on a second. This is what I was talking about. Uh, Ernest took this. This is some guy and two of Ernest's sons. I have no idea who that guy is. This is the Negro Leagues. I, I found Rickwood Field. I st Rick, Ernest photographed there um, in the late 40s and early 50s. I started going there and started photographing the Negro League players. This is Roosevelt Jefferson, who just died at age 100 three years ago. He was legally blind, and he talks more than I do. Um, fascinating fella. And um, I, I always ask them, and I always chat with them. I don't, like I said, I don't just run up to people and go click. Um, next, this is a group of these fellows. This is a friend of mine, Ernest Oink Harris. And they were all looking at another photographer, except for Ernest, who looked right at me. Um, <laughs> Ernest, re Ernest re left major, uh, black baseball, went to the post office, and he had just retired when, uh, when I became friends with him. And I said, Ernest, what do you do now that you're retired? And he said, well, I sit around the house and I worry about things. And I thought, what a perfect answer to that. Um, now I do the same thing. But, but again, next, that's Henry Elmore somebody else who I've become friendly with. They're overjoyed to still be recognized. Um, the Negro Leagues ended in 1961, and they're still invited all over the country for celebrations. They're delighted. There's a banquet for them every year at Rickwood. They're delighted that people still have an interest in them. This is Ernest. This was my closest friend, Willie Lee, and this is Jesse Mitchell. Willie passed um, four years ago. We used to talk to each other all the time. He used to send me pecans from his tree in the backyard. He used to um, huck them for me um, until his wrist couldn't handle it anymore. And then he'd send me raw pecans. And Olga, who's online here, um, used to sit in my office and was beneficiary of some of those. But these two gentlemen, Willie and uh, Jesse, have passed. So this is one of the first pictures I took of the Negro Leagues. Yeah, we can go forward. Um, this, uh, I just included a, a few of, this is from the Harlem Gospel Choir uh, that are on display until tomorrow at the Multicultural Arts Center. The Multicultural Arts Center has an offshoot where they present music called Joyful Noise. And they've been bringing the Harlem Gospel Choir to Sanders Theater at Harvard since 2005. And I've probably seen close to every one of them. In 2014, an usher stopped me from taking pictures. It was legitimate. They said no pictures, and I had already taken 50, so I didn't fuss. But I contacted their manager in New York, Anna Bailey, sent them the pictures, sent her the pictures that I had, and she said, you can come anywhere we are in the world and photograph. Um, and I started, the show was a culmination of 25 times I photographed them. They haven't been at Sanders uh, for the last two years because Sanders was closing because of the pandemic. We hope they're back there next. They always come on Martin Luther King weekend. We hope they're back there next year, of course. Um, I'm going down to shoot them in New York on Mother's Day. They're doing very solo concerts. Um, they, used, they used to do Wednesdays with a gospel brunch in Times Square. And I hope when they get back to that, a lot of people that are on here today have seen them because I drag people to them. And uh, I'm always in New York, uh, not always, but they give, me, they give me a table up front with four seats. So if anybody's in New York, when they get playing there and you wanna come and see them, it's all comped for me. So come and join me, many people have. So 
uh, yeah, that's that's Craig. The, these people have become my friends, and I really look forward to um, to seeing them again. Uh, I was told by their their manager, she said, "You're one of the choir now," and I think that's one of the best compliments I've ever received in my life. It, it was really something else. Um, so, so I'm going to stop the share. For yeah, now, I think that's please. it. Please stop. And then um, we can open it up if anybody has questions. We still have a few minutes for that. I'll just add to the story of Bill Chapman, who I'd worked with for a number of years on campus. Um, I hired him twice. You think I would have learned after the first time, but you know, <laughs> he, 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 he was always an excellent colleague on campus and people enjoyed meeting with mm -hmm. him. It's just a total coincidence that all the student employees happened to be my advisees. Um, that was never rigged or anything. And a few of them are here <laughs> right now. Um, and it's great that they are still supporting a uh, bill like this. Uh, bill said before, uh, there was a bumper sticker back during the years that he and I were in college, my country right or wrong. And people who were supporting the Vietnam War would have that, but they didn't have the complete quote by Patrick Henry, which was my country right or wrong, right to be kept right, wrong to be made right. Um, those people would vote for Trump today. <laughs> yep. I, I just pulled that out at the last second and I knew it had some not so good connotations back, um, but it's still true. You know, we try to make things better, all of us, or we should be, um, and we go forward. And I can see boss, boss. I think there's another boss on here. Yeah. Um, two more. Olga, Madalena, Nico. Madalena, Miko, Olga. Um, I think Bruno was on here for a while, so. Um, yeah, these were all people that I worked with at Harvard, and they were all, Bob, Bob was their freshman advisor, and we stuck around and all hung out together. So come visit, guys, or I'll come visit you. Any other <laughs> Nico's questions? In, Nico's in Berlin. Olga is in Chicago? Ohio. 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 Cleveland, yeah, my sympathies. Um, uh, Madalena is in New York. Uh, Maruna is in Sweden, and we've kept in touch. But please, folks, questions. For comments or takeaways from the work, I invite you also to share what you took away from seeing those pieces. We went through actually, a lot. I actually have a question for Bill. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, so Bill, one of the things that has always impressed me about your photography is the vividness of the colors in your work. And I'm wondering, do you, for example, someone's eyes might match a plant behind them or someone's tie might match some color on a sign. And I'm wondering, do you notice that when you're taking the photo, do you look for that? Or is that something that, no. are you more focused on the subject? I'm focused on the subject. Um, I will square it and make sure that the composition is right and get as much extraneous material out of it um, when I compose. But I'm more interested in the subject. Somebody asked me uh, yesterday if that portrait of Emma was a backdrop. And I said, no, that's the Charles River. <laughs> um, so no, it's all, it's all as real as I can get it. And I don't fake the colors in Photoshop. I, I do very, very little in Photoshop, if anything. Hey, little boss. Hey, Bill. Hi. Um, you talk about your use of color, but what I find fascinating is that so many of your pictures look three-dimensional. Like right now, I'm looking at all the different pictures of people visiting you today, but your, your image of you, you look three-dimensional. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, well, I'm actually from another dimension. Uh, oh, okay. You should know. No, um, I, I was very disappointed when they uh, ended color printing, as we know it, um, and digital, I've learned to trick to make it look. Uh, there's nothing to match a color print, a real color print made from film. And I'm sure a lot of you know that. Um, but I learned to trick digital so it looks like a color print. Um, and that's, that's the way I shoot my camera set and I never change the settings. And um, that, that's probably the reason. It's, it's uh, kind of fascinating because um... It to, to me, it looked literally looked three dimensional. Like you know, the, the figure was in the foreground, and the background was separated. 
it was obvious. Yeah, if the background separated, it means I'm using a, a large f-stop. And it's it will one o'clock. Hmm? That was my that was my computer talking. Oh oh oh, oh. Uh, yeah that 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 will happen and uh, since I shoot mostly in sunlight for the most part um, portraits that you get less of that but that's the reason. Donald had the show at the Multicultural Arts Center before me. We hadn't seen each other in at least thirty years. I did not know he was going to be the show before me, and we reconnected. Um, and I'm very grateful and thankful that we did, and, and Elizabeth Lizzie too. I think that's actually a really nice point well, to, to- I was going to say to Bill that um, you're so different than the Bill I knew in the, in the 70s. <laughs> I mean, I didn't see you as a geek back then. I saw oh. you as a burned out hippie freak. <laughs> yeah, I did. But we I all did, were. I, yeah, we all were. I did my yeah. best to hide it. Oh, grow long hair and wear a tie dye t shirt, and you're not a nerd anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, you are, but. <laughs> Folks, speak up. I think we have maybe time for one more question, and then I think we're almost out of time. Is that right, Adria? Yeah, I think we're just going over now, but I, I want to make sure that people have a voice if they want to share anything. And I do also like, I think it's a beautiful story to see that. Donald was able to show his work and, and then Bill and Adriana, we have a show of, of yours coming up uh, after the Cambridge Public School show. So um, thrilled to have the representation of our artists on this call. Yeah, me too. So Bill, what are you photographing now? Not much because of the pandemic. I'm, I'm phasing myself back into it. Uh, I photographed uh, another concert, the Blind Boys of Alabama up in Portsmouth for a book that's coming out, but I'm, I photograph out my kitchen window sometimes. Um, and I'll get back out there by, by promise and you'll be the first to know about it with a big chocolate donut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I do encourage you, many of you know Bill, um, but if you are not already following him online to see what he's doing next, um, I'm going to drop his Instagram handle into the chat here and check him out. Uh, he'll, he does have a project he's coming up with uh, that maybe you can speak more to uh, at the Birmingham Institute. Bill, do you want to say anything about that? Uh, yeah, I've shown Negro League stuff at the Birmingham uh, Civil Rights Institute uh, in 2010, and I'm coming up again this summer. And if I could ask a favor, could we hear from Delia? Yes, no, hi, sorry, uh, I had to unmute myself. So I do have a very quick question for you. Uh, it's very much connected to the um, exhibit, which I found as, you know, absolutely beautiful because uh, somehow you always manage to find the color in the gray world we live in. And I think the explosion of, of color that the uh, uh, gospel choir shows is, is really amazing. And I couldn't help noticing that all the figures you photograph, they emanate light. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, where does the problem of faith in relation to what you do come in? Because I think it's a very important question in the world we live in. And you could actually connect it to what you said about the photograph with the uh, uh, Martin Luther King statue, because you referred to it as people came so dressed as if they're in a church. Yes. Um, you know, the, uh, the African American churches are, are, uh, very well noted and it was, you come in your finery, um, as, as a lot of people do at church, but, um, what happened is they would have the church service early and then they would go to a Negro league baseball game. I realize that has nothing to do with your question, but, um, it's it's all part of that culture uh, and um my my failure and i wanted to say this is that the photographs cannot approach what they bring to the world their music um is stupefying uh they don't just do gospel music they do tributes to other people and as long as they can connect it somehow 
I've heard them do Aretha Franklin and Stevie Wonder and Whitney Houston and Prince and Michael Jackson. So it adds quite a different dimension to their concerts. It's fun, um, another, an, another dimension. So what I did in a lot of those photographs, I had 2000 files, 25 times I shot them. I looked for pictures where light was, the, was an element. I've got light coming out of one of their mouths. I've got light, a woman with a microphone that points to pointing with light in back of her. I looked for those on purpose just to give it as much emphasis as I could on how bright and, and spiritual a thing they are. Yeah. yeah, and I encourage um, those of you who are not able to see the show in person to check it out so you can see all of the video, uh, the, the photographs that um, Bill took and what those ones that he selected um, on a virtual gallery, which will be up uh, past the closure of the show. So take your time. I'll drop it here for you to take a look. Yeah, um, contact me. I'm, I'm too accessible sometimes, but I'd be <laughs> glad to hear from all of you again. And I'm delighted to see all the bosses and Donald and Lizzie, I, I don't want to go through all the names, but um, please contact me and support the Multicultural Arts Center. It's uh, when somebody reviewed my show there, they called it a hidden gem and I don't want that to be thought of. They put on all kinds of dance performances and music performances and spoken word performances. They're very, very, very busy all of the time. Thanks, and I'm Jerry. very flattered and pleased to um, be asked to, to show photographs there. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow that up just to close us off. Thank you so much, Bill. It's been wonderful having you show and we're looking forward to the next upcoming show. So I want you all to know that the Cambridge Public School Show is coming up. We encourage you to come by. We do it every year and it's a wonderful um, group of students who are represented. And then um, at following that is Adriana's show, which we're really excited for. So please, please stay in touch and if you, um, I'll send here are some ways for you to follow us. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter. You can follow us on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. Um, and then, of course, uh, as you said, Bill, there's a couple of events coming up. We're very busy in February and March, so um, I would encourage you all to check it out. Uh, Celebrity Series of Boston, we're inviting them to produce a show um, that is a, a, a really incredible pairing of two performers and the uh, Cambridge Jazz Foundation is also doing a series of events this coming weekend. Um, not this coming weekend, following weekend, the 11th and 12th. So I'm going to drop those in the chat too, um, but you can find all this information on our website as well. One more quick thing. I promise it'll be quick. Yeah. I want to thank Amanda Accardi and Bruce Myron. Amanda does all of my framing and framing for a lot of Boston. She's at Around the Corner Framing um, in the South End. And Bruce uh, is where, Bruce's lab is where I printed the pictures. He's a master printer of black and white and color. Uh, he exhibits quite frequently. Um, and I couldn't have done it without either of them. Um, I'll be working with both of them very, very soon. And, and thanks you too. So uh, as Ernest would say, be the best you can. <laughs> I didn't realize that was your last name. Great to have you on the call. Yeah, thank you so much for thanking those people. And thank you, Bill. And thank you, Zoe. And thank you, all of our attendees today. This will be posted online. So if you want to take a look back at anything, feel free to. Um, on and our good night for CBS News. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Thank you. thank you so much, Adrian, Zoe, for organizing this. And uh, um, I, this is Adriana speaking. I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm so I'm so honored to be coming to the Multicultural Arts Center after Donald and Bill. I mean, the the, the shows are amazing, and it's true. It's a hidden gem, and I we hope that it's not hidden anymore. And Bill, your show looks amazing. Uh, I was there last week, so thank you so much for. Thank you, today. thank you. I'm looking forward to your show. Thank you. And thank you all. All right. thank, thank you, you all. all. Bye. Bye bye.